I. The peace of our blessed Lord be with you. Welcome to the evening of this day, Sunday, 24th March, 2024. Passion Sunday, which begins the Holy Week. We want to bless God for bringing us to yet another Holy Week in our lives. To mark, to commemorate the great events that mark our salvation. Why is it that throughout the year, a week is dedicated and called Holy Week? It is called Holy because it is during this week that the most holy things concerning our salvation happen to us. First creation took place within seven days a week. That is six days with God resting on the seventh day. If the first creation with the creation of man on the sixth day happened within six days, then the restoration of man to his original dignity had to happen within another week period. This is the week in which the most holy things concerning our salvation happen. I repeat, because it is in this week that explicitly, explicitly we shall receive two sacraments for our sanctification. The sacrament of the Holy Eucharist and the sacrament of priesthood. It is in this week that implicitly we receive five other sacraments. Baptism. because with the death of Christ and our baptism, we are buried with Christ to rise again. Baptism. Confirmation. It is after his death and resurrection on Holy Sunday, Easter Sunday, when he had ascended into heaven, 50 days later of his death, death and resurrection, he will bring us the Holy Spirit for our sacrament of confirmation. So uh, implicitly, this week will bring us the sacrament of confirmation. Three, if Christ dies to forgive us our sins, then implicitly we receive another sacrament, the sacrament of reconciliation. Implicitly, we receive the sacrament of healing in this week because after his death and departure, he gives authority to the disciples to heal and anoint the sick, bring them restoration of health, mind and body. Then as an overflow, of Christ's departure, marriage will be sanctified and brought back to its original dignity as it was at God's created at the beginning. What a week. Indeed, it is the Holy Week. This week begins with Passion Sunday or Palm Sunday. It is Passion Sunday. Palm Sunday because of the palms we carry to accompany Jesus to commemorate his entry, his last entry into Jerusalem. So on this day, the liturgy permits that before the celebration, there should be a procession outside the principal church where the celebration will take place. And the procession take place with priests and ministers leading this procession, carrying green leaves. These green leaves could be palm branches or olives, depending on the region where you live. So we carry olive branches, but in Africa, my country, Ghana, are fit for carrying palm branches. Palm branches in the scripture was a, was a symbol used to accompany the just. Those of you who want to understand it, I will invite you to listen or go and watch my previous videos on Passion Sunday or Palm Sunday in the past years. But because of time, I don't want to go to the, into the significance of palm branches and olives. I've done that in previous years. So I humbly ask you to go back to watch those videos. Tonight, however, I want us to focus on the procession and those who accompany Jesus as he makes his last entry into Jerusalem. I present you with the persons, the images that mark, because it's Mark's gospel we are reading today, his passion, the whole of chapter 14, the whole of chapter 15. Look at all the images that are presented to us as seen in accompanying Jesus as he makes his last entry into Jerusalem for his death. And look at each of these people and see if you can identify yourself. If I can also identify myself. Which of these persons do you identify yourself with? 
So without taking the gospel, I present you the images I've selected for our meditation tonight. We want to begin, dearly beloved, with Mark 14, chapter 14, verse 1. The scene begins in the home of Simon the leper. Simon the leper is not Simon Peter. These are two different people. So how do we identify ourselves with Simon the leper? He is the man who organizes the last social gathering for Jesus. You can call it the last party. Yes, this was not a religious gathering. The last religious gathering will be the last supper where we will receive the Holy Eucharist and the Holy Priesthood as a gift. So the last party where all people were around, even the woman will come there with oil, was in the home of Simon the leper. The question we are asking ourselves is, have we been generous with people or to people? Not only Jesus, but even to our own kind, Simon the leper. Simon the leper who gave the last party to Jesus before he enters Jerusalem to suffer and die. In that same setting in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with a very expensive perfume to anoint Jesus, anticipating Jesus' death and burial. And Jesus said it. This action of this woman will be remembered anywhere the gospel is proclaimed. And here we are, over 2,000 years after this event, we are remembering this woman. Who is an anonymous? His na her name is not mentioned. What religious gestures are we doing for the body of Christ? Without fear, without favor. We are not doing this to please people. The woman did not see herself as the only woman among men. She was. All that she wanted to do was to come and anoint Jesus. I know there are some very beautiful souls here who do things secretly for God's people, lay and priest alike, without even telling people secretly, this is what they do. They don't care whether man will do it. They don't care whether priest will do it. This is what they think they have been called to do. Can you identify yourself as this woman who brings this expensive perfume? Yet, in that same gathering, we see people complaining. They were indignant, remarking after the other. This could have been sold and the money given to the poor. Such are people who never give anything to the poor. They are just choosing this occasion to complain. They come to church. There is an, a gathering to, to, to collect funds, to support church activities. And these people are complaining, but you don't see them offering anything. There are some who from morning to evening begin the day and end their day complaining with their spouse, complaining about their family, complaining about the church, everything is good, complaining about everything going on in the world, complaining about their nations. We can't live our lives just like that. You can't accompany Jesus into Jerusalem with complaints, no. Then Judas Iscariot, the betrayer, she was, uh, he was at the garden. But he will leave and go and transact business with the next group, the chief priest. They were delighted to do business with Judas. They want to take opportunity of this event and bring Jesus to his feet. Dearly beloved, after these first five people, let us now look at where the last supper will take place. The last religious event of Jesus. The room that gave us the priesthood. The room that gave us the Holy Eucharist. The man in whose guest room the Passover was eating. Wow. There are some beautiful souls I've known. Who have given their homes to priests, to seminarians. Who have invited people to their homes. Lay people and priests alike. There are people who have given their homes when there were no churches. That communities will be raised and later churches will be built. These are people who are accompanying Christ as he makes his last entry into Jerusalem. When it was evening, he came with his twelve. They are still with Jesus. The closest disciples, the closest friends he had, not even his family were close to him like that. The new people Christ has chosen. Yes, not Christians. Christ who abandoned the Father, Spirit, and come among us. 
and make us his brothers. We are the closest friends, brothers and sisters in Jesus. Yes. We are with Christ when everything is calm, when we are about to eat like they are about to eat the Last Supper. But there will be a moment when none of these 12 will be around. But now let's concentrate when how they stay with Christ when everything is calm. How we stay in church when everything is calm. When we are at adoration, when everything is calm. When we are praying the rosary, when everything is calm. When we are going for ordinations, when everything is calm. The 12, the closest friends of Jesus. Then of this 12, he takes away three, Peter, James, and John, when they went into the Garden of Gethsemane. Why does he take three? Because these are the three who witnessed the transfiguration. Jesus knew that he, they could pray because they had seen the manifestation of his glory on Mount Tabo, the transfiguration. Of all Christians, some receive special gift to be prophets, healers, bishops, cardinals, priests, deacons, religious men and women. Those of us who have been privileged to receive this gift as catechists, as teachers in church, as leaders of societies, How are we staying with Jesus? How are we accompanying the body of Christ, the church, till now? Dearly beloved, we move on. We come to Simon Peter. We see, look at, we come to the twelve, the three, and one, Peter. When they had gotten into the garden, they were sleeping when Jesus went to pray. Why were they sleeping? Is it because they had had too much wine at the Last Supper? It could be possible. Maybe they are taking too much wine at the Last Supper. Jesus, in his most difficult moment when he needed them, they were found sleeping. They couldn't wait. They couldn't keep watch for an hour. He singles out Peter because he was the one making promises that he would be with him even when all the others had deserted him. Really, beloved, Christ in his difficult moments found no company. And when he came back the third time and found them sleeping, he said, now you can sleep. My traitor is at hand. My betrayer is at hand. This morning I told the people in church that when we were growing, those of us who did not come from so rich families and we had parents and grandparents who were, who were struggling to make it in life, there were times that you went to sleep around 10, 11 p.m. or even 12 midnight. And our parents could not sleep. Our parents were just lying on the bed and their eyes were counting whatever was on the ceiling. We children were fast asleep because we had no problem. But our parents couldn't sleep. Even till today, they're still happening to people. Some mothers go to bed around 10 p.m. Then 11 p.m., there's no sleep. At 12 midnight, there's no sleep. 1 a.m., 2 a.m., they can't close their eyes. Because they are thinking of what is happening to their children. They are thinking of their lives, how they are going to carry their families. But these children are fast asleep. That is Jesus for you. Jesus could not close his eyes because it was a very difficult moment for them. Do you see yourself like Jesus here? You see people you have to cater for. Your children, your church members sleep clean. But you as a bishop, as a priest, you can't keep your eyes closed. Because there is a lot on your shoulders, a lot you have to do. That is you. Then there's Judas who comes again, one of the twelve. He comes up, the traitor. In church, in the family, in movements, are you becoming the one who becomes always a traitor, bringing things of church outside into the public space? It happened some time ago in the Vatican. A steward, somebody who was very close to Pope Benedict, he was the one who brought these things out. Today, because of money, we can do Everything because of money. People keep secrets with us and we are not able to hold these secrets. People trust us with their lives and we can't hold these pressures for them. And we destroy them. Some have betrayed people and led these people to commit suicide. There is a crowd that comes with swords and clubs. Come to arrest Jesus. This group came from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. There are people whose desire is always to thwart the Air Force. 
They want to resist any change in the church, in society, in our nation. Their duty is to organize people, to cause harm, to cause problems. We find it in the political arena. We find this even in church. Yes. People struggling for leadership positions in the church. They are lobbying to be bishops, lobbying to be cardinals, lobbying to be priests, lobbying to be cardinals. When, uh, cut his, when they receive these positions, they can't do anything. Are you a chief priest, a scribe, and an elder who is lobbying just to build your CV but not to serve? There's a young man was around, they seized him, but he escaped naked. Ask yourself, why was this narrative inserted here? What has this young man got to do on the scene? He was seized. He left his mantle, then he escaped naked. Who is that young man who was around the scene that escapes naked? There is nothing that is hidden that will not be brought to bear. Who is that young man? Are you the one? Am I the one? The chief priests, the elders, the high priests, and the scribes. Many people were giving false testimony against him. As people still continue to do against us. Then those who spit on Jesus, who blindfold him and beat him with their fist. The officers who took custody of him and slapped him. Today, people are spitting on Jesus in the holy name. Pilate, who questions him. The chief priest who started accusing him of many things. Barabbas, who was imprisoned with rebels, but because of the Jesus' event, is liberated. You see, the event of Christ and his procession brings freedom to Barabbas. The crowd that comes up to tell, crucify him. The soldiers that took him away, dressed him in, beat him. Simon of Cyrene, who carries Jesus' cross. So many people who, despite their difficulties, still have time to accompany church, the weak and the needy. The two rebels who are crucified with Jesus. In Mark's version, we are told that they spoke ill of Jesus, but in Luke, it's only one of them who spoke ill against Jesus. The passers-by who held abuse at him, shaking their heads. People who pass by in front of your church and they accuse you of worshiping Mary without knowing what they are saying. Yes. This is accusation our Protestant brothers and sisters always raise against us in ignorance and they still don't want to learn. Someone who ran and filled a sponge with sour wine put it on the lips of Jesus. The centurion who comes to believe at the last moment of the procession of Jesus to his death. Some women who were watching from a distance, Joseph of Arimathea who asked for his body, Mary and Mary, the mother of Joseph, who saw where Jesus was placed. Dearly beloved, are you Joseph of Arimathea? Are you the women who watch from a distance? So I told the women in church, before COVID, we all coming to church. Then COVID came. We stopped coming to church and we were blaming not on COVID. We said, oh, we are watching TV. But nobody watches TV and receives the Holy Eucharist. Mary Magdalene and the mother Mary, they do not only watch from a distance. They later came close and saw where Jesus was laid. The passion of Mark begins with a woman anointing Jesus and it, it ends with women seeing where Jesus was laid, dearly beloved. There's a duty we are called upon, dearly beloved, not to stay far off and watch Jesus, but to get close. This is the Holy Week when the most holy things happen to us. Let us dignify this week. Let us thank God for this week. This week is not a week for mourning. On Good Friday, we are not going to celebrate the funeral of Jesus. We are recording, record, recommemorating that great event that brought our salvation. Good Friday. Bishop of Tamale once said, We don't go for the funeral of Christ on Good Friday. No. Christ is not dying again. If you are going to funeral, let us mourn ourselves. Let us thank God for this great period, this holy season. If you are delighted with this message, bless a soul, a 